I was going to say you may be seated, but everybody's already there. So uh, we're going to go. By the way, uh, again, uh, if you're watching this uh, from the internet, uh, I, I forgot my, my shirt today. So I'll be running home in between the two services to get my shirt. But I did want to say, I, I, I was sitting there thinking to myself, should I go and run and get my shirt and get back right before it's time to preach? And I thought to myself, you know what? I need to worship. Like in order for me to preach the way that I'm going to preach, I need to be able to worship. And so I was like, you know what? It's going to be casual Sunday today. So there, there we go. It's casual Sunday. And um, let me go ahead and get started uh, by reminding you of the way that we started this series a couple weeks ago. We started this series with the last words of Jesus. And the last words of Jesus start like this. Go make disciples. Go make disciples. And that is what Jesus has called all of us to do. That, that is some of the most important words that he could have possibly uttered. And he chose to use the words go make disciples disciples. And you and I need to be in the process of making disciples of Jesus of other people. The first week we talked about, you know, in in case you're kind of scared about this whole process, hey, start by just inviting somebody to come to to go to church. Invite somebody to come listen to a sermon with you. Because after all, that's that's what Jesus, that's what the followers of Jesus did at first. And remember, he was preaching these sermons to thousands of people. And it had an effect on their lives, but it, you know, it was an effect because there were thousands of people, but it only changed their lives a little bit. Last week, we asked the question, what happens when sermons aren't enough? What, what if you want more of a change of your life than just this? And last week, we talked about the beauty of small groups and, and how Jesus got together with 12 disciples, and it was because they spent that time together that their roots grew deeper and faster than everybody else who had just listened to sermons. But today, I, I believe that there is an untapped source of discipleship that is deeper than even those two things. And so today, I want to ask the question, what is the most effective form of discipleship. What is the most effective form of discipleship? And it reminds me of, this whole thing kind of reminds me of the parable of the talents. Do you guys remember that story in, in the Bible, the parable of the talents? Remember a talent was a, was a unit of measure of money and so a talent was like this bag of money and it, and it was weight. So, you know, it could be a talent of gold or a talent of silver but in the story, there was, a, there, there was a man who was a very rich man, and he entrusted his money to three of his servants. And he gave them different um, amounts, and, and he, he told them to be faithful with it. And so two of the servants went out, they invested the money, and they made back double uh, what, what they had been given by the master. But the one servant, he was afraid. He didn't want to lose the master's money, and so he buried it in the ground In the backyard. When the master came back, he said of the two servants that had invested the money, Well done, good and faithful servants. Then he turned to the one who didn't do anything with the money. He said, Depart from me, you wicked, evil servant. I want you to think about that for for a second. Okay, over the last 2,000 years, We've always understood that that meant so much more than just money. In fact, the English word talent comes from this parable. Okay, this idea that gifts and talents, the the gifts that God has given you, that we should be using those for what? Go make disciples. And scripture says that there's going to come a day where we're going to have to stand in front of the throne of God. And Jesus is going to ask us. Now, I think, you know, some of us, we think, well, because we know Jesus Christ, we don't have to stand under judgment. Listen, I believe even as Christians, we're going to have to stand in front of the throne and give an account of how we lived our lives. And in that moment, I think the only thing that we're going to be able to remember is go 
make disciples. And I don't know about you, but when Jesus gets to me, I'm hoping to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And the only way I'm going to be able to hear those words is if I figure out what the most effective form of discipleship actually is. Now, in order to answer this question, we're going to open up to some scriptures. Um, Matthew chapter 17. Jesus, every once in a while, would, uh, he, while he had the thousands that he would preach to, he had the 12 disciples. There were three disciples that he, he tended to kind of zero in on. It was Peter, James, and John. This is towards the end of his uh, ministry. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. After six days... Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So not only did Jesus take the 12 disciples away from the crowds, there were times where he actually separated himself with Peter, James, and John from even the, the crowd of the 12. So he takes them up on the mountain, verse 12. There he was transfigured. So just to make this story easy, we're going to remember this as the mountain of transfiguration, right? It's just simple stuff. There, was, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And so Jesus takes them up on, on this mountain, and he shares one of the most intimate moments with them. He lets them see who he really is. And so imagine if Jesus gives you his actual form that he's had for all of, of eternity. Verse 3. And if that wasn't freaky enough, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now Moses had been dead for 2,000 years. Elijah around 1,000 years. And, and you know what's funny is I say this, and we have, we have no concept. I was talking with Lewis about that this morning. We have no concept of that kind of age in this country. Like, our, our country is, what, 200 years old? You know, how old is, uh, is uh, uh, St. Augustine, the fort of St. Augustine? I think we, we thought maybe about four or 500 years old. Like, we have no idea. And yet, here are these guys who were, who were ancestors who were dead, and they're sitting there having a conversation with Jesus and imagine being the disciples listening in on this. And Peter is totally geeked out about this whole thing. In verse 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is so good for us to be here, right? Like this is the best moment I've ever had in my life. Let's, let's just stay here. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he was interrupted. Because the next verse says, in verse 5, while he was still speaking. I love this. There's a couple times in scripture where it says it. It says this when Nebuchadnezzar is bragging about himself. While he was still speaking, boom, God spoke, right? In the same way, while he was saying, I'll make one a shelter for you, for, for Moses, and for Elijah. He didn't even get Elijah out of his mouth. When a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now when you hear the voice of God, at least the way that everybody seems to react in Scripture, whenever they hear the voice of God the Father, it is terrifying. And in the same way, verse 6, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. You, you know how scary it is like when, when a lightning strike hits real close by and you hear that, that, that thunder clap and it makes you jump? Imagine hearing the voice of the booming God. I love this in verse 7. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. My dad's just got a deep voice, right? Like, it's cool. Verse 8, and when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. But it's at this point that the teaching begins. 
right? Verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So he's walking down from the mount, uh, mountain of transfiguration. He goes, listen, what happens on the mountain of transfiguration stays on the mountain of transfiguration, right? And, and, and it wasn't forever. It was just he didn't want people to know about this until he had raised from the dead, right? But then he goes a little, uh, then they, they start asking him questions. And this is the beauty of this form of discipleship. Verse 10, the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And they're still thinking about, G about God saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Clearly, Jesus is not only the Messiah, but he's the unexpected the Messiah. Right? He's, he's the, the, the son of man that, that had been talked about in the Old Testament who was going to come down from the clouds. He was the, the flesh and blood son of, of God the Father. And so they were like, Jesus, but there's something that doesn't fit. All the teachers of the law, they've always told us that Elijah would come before the Messiah. Clearly, you're the Messiah. So how come we got to see Elijah up there, but nobody else has been able to see him? Verse 11, Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. Verse 12, but I tell you. Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, and in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. He said, listen, Elijah already came, and they treated him really badly, and they're going to treat me really badly too. Verse 13, and then the disciples understand that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist was an Elijah-like figure who came and did the work that Elijah did, and he made the paths straight so that when Jesus came, that people would listen to him. And for his trouble, they chopped off his head, and it would be worse for Jesus. But that's what it would look like when Jesus would take them off by themselves. Actually, towards the end of the chapter, there, there's another little picture of, of an intimate moment that he has with Peter. Uh, verse 24, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Right, so they were walking in and, and they're collecting taxes and Jesus just kind of walks by the table. And so... You know, it was already too late, so, so they look at Peter and they go, hey, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter's like, yeah, 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 he pays. I don't want to get him in trouble. But Jesus wants to teach him something deeper than this. Verse 25, yes, he does, Peter replied. But then when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. Before Peter, Peter could go and say, hey, Jesus, you forgot to pay the temple tax, Jesus comes up to him and he says, what do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? Right? When, when a king collects taxes, do they, do they collect it from their own children or do they collect it from other people? Verse 26, from others, Peter answered, then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. The whole reason why Jesus walked by the tax collector's booth was to teach Peter, hey, remember what just happened on the mountain of transfiguration? Remember my father? You remember who he said I was? Don't you believe that? Yeah. But those guys outside, they really want their taxes. And so in verse 27, Jesus says, but so that we may not offend them. Go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. And I believe Peter went out, put his, his 
fishing rod and, and the, the first fish that he caught miraculously had a coin in his mouth saying, and Jesus was saying, God will provide. Now, this is a great example of, of how Jesus ha- would have these face-to-face discipleship moments. But he was Jesus. What about the rest of us? I'm only going to uh, read to you two more verses. And that will be from 2 Timothy chapter 2. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, You then, my son. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. And Paul really, really liked Timothy. And Timmy, Timothy really, really liked Paul. And they spent a whole lot of time together. And this is what Paul says to him. You then, my son. Timothy was not his biological son, but he was so close to Timothy that he called him his son. He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, and here's our key verse, verse 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust those things to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. This was what, this was the format by which the most intimate, effective form of discipleship would happen. Take all the things that I've taught you and all the things that you've heard me say. You know, as you've walked with me and I've spent time with you, now I want you to do that with other people who then will turn around and do that with other people. And that was the plan. And so when we look at this, we go, what is the most effective form of discipleship? Face-to-face discipleship changes everything. Face-to-face discipleship changes everything. Now, I'd like to illustrate this for you, and I brought this board, but then I realized as I'm standing here, I have no stand. So what I was hoping is I could get maybe Mike and Donnie, could you guys come up here and actually stand up here on the stage? Perfect. All right. So I wanted to kind of demonstrate what this actually looks like. In real life, this face-to-face discipleship thing. So, um, it, it all starts, this, my story today, and by the way, th- these are all true stories, okay? My story today starts with this really, really handsome looking guy, Pastor Todd of the Pulse of Miami Church, right? He, he starts, he starts this, this whole church thing and gets the church established, and then after he gets established, he gets a call. From this really cool chick, because she's got her sunglasses on, Mercy. And Mercy calls me, and, and or, I'm sorry, she calls Pastor Todd, and she, said, and she asks about the church, and she says that her and her husband really, really need to go to church again, and, and they had kind of, you know, their church had closed down, and so she, she asks if she could come. I'm like, of course, and so or, um, Pastor Todd says, of course. And so she comes on a day when her husband is working, and she comes back uh, af- after coming to church that day, and she goes, sweetheart, you've got to come the next week. And so the next week, her very cool husband, also with the sunglasses, shows up. Now, I'm going to tell you something that Donnie and Mercy would be willing to tell you. When they came, they had some issues that they were trying to work through. Is that fair? And so... Pastor Todd took some time to invest in Mercy and in Donnie. And they even started coming to uh, our small group where they met this other really cool girl, Ty Garcia. She's also cool because she has on sunglasses. And then the neat thing was is that a relationship began to form between Mercy and Ty and she started discipling or spending time with Ty. Lo and behold, and this is the way that God works, okay, because they, they did not do this as couples, but Umbert, her husband, Ty's husband, started a relationship with Donnie. Now, if you can see in this picture here, he is nowhere near as cool as the rest of them. He doesn't have any sunglasses, and he's about to kiss a frog, right? So, He's definitely not one of the cool ones, um, but uh, if you post something on social media, don't get mad if I print it up and and bring it up here for something, all right? That's all I'm saying. 
And I was thinking that maybe that was Ty before he kissed her and turned her into the princess that she is today, right? But not only did Donnie start spending time with this guy, but he also started spending time with a guy by the name of Kyle. Now, if you don't know Kyle, if you have kids in our kids' ministry, you should, because Kyle works with Donnie every single Sunday to help set up the children's ministry. And so because of this relationship, you've been blessed. But then something even cooler happened. There was my daughter who decided to put this picture on my phone, all right, was having problems with math. And while Umbert is not a very cool person. He's really good at math. He's an engineer. And so he started helping her with her homework, but then she was also going through a tough time, and so he also spent some time giving her some advice. And interestingly enough, so did Ty. So look, look, look at how this works. Pastor Todd spends time with these two people who invest in other people who then in turn invest in and Pastor Todd's daughter. But you know what? I want to tell you more stories. There was a, another person that Pastor Todd met, specifically in youth ministry. He was a little crazy. He's a little out there. But he fits in really well with Pastor Todd, right? They, they, they really click together. And actually, if, if you don't know Caleb... Um, you should because because of this relationship right here, Caleb actually runs the sound for our church. And so you're blessed because of this relationship that's happening. But this really crazy thing happened. This one Sunday morning, he came in with bags under his eyes. And he was t telling me that he had this, he was on the phone with a friend all night long talking to him because he had broken up with his girlfriend and didn't know what he was going to do. And, and so he invited Jose to church that day, and Jose raised his hand to say yes to Jesus that Sunday. Amen. But this started a relationship where Caleb started pouring into Jose. Interestingly enough, years later, then Jose would come back and begin to invest back in Caleb and the two of them would be closer to Jesus because of each other. But you know, soon after uh, Jose <laughs> um, said yes to Jesus, he invited his brother. It was on social media, all right? Who apparently was a cowboy in another life, right? <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so, if you don't know this guy, maybe if you took off his cowboy hat, you would recognize that he, he leads worship for all of us here on Sunday, and we are all blessed because of that relationship. And then here's, here's the neat thing. Caleb ends up taking a, an interest in Pastor Todd's son, Joshua. And he takes Joshua and teaches him how to fish, Jose also comes to small group, and they invest time in Joshua. Now, I, I could tell stories all day long. I'm only going to tell you one brief one more, and you guys will appreciate this one. Um, there's this other guy by the name of Gene Salas. Now, you, you recognize him in a certain way, but this is how I remember Gene Salas, because when he came to youth ministry, that's what he looked like, you know, however many years ago. And so Pastor Todd also was spending time with Gene. And then Gene invites the very lovely Maria Centeno. And if you don't know Maria Centeno, she is a, she is a blessing to everybody around her. Interestingly enough, um, Maria, and I'm not even going to put this on here. I'm just going to put, Maria ends up inviting her cousin, Magda and her cousin's uh, fiancé, Javier, and I got the opportunity to, to do their wedding for them, right? But not only that, Maria ends up investing time in my daughter, 
when she was going through a hard time. But this is how God works. This last uh, Sunday night, Maria actually said, you know, the part of my faith that I need work on the most is prayer. And you know who texted her almost every single day this last week? My daughter. And so not only is this going this way. In fact, it, it, it comes back and it's a blessing. And then, and then she ends up taking Rebecca out for coffee this week. And, and isn't that the way that this whole thing works? Is when, when you disciple with somebody, there's, there's an effect back on you. And, and, and you know what? This is, this is, it's, it's so hard to chart out because really Donnie and Mercy have spent time with my children. And these people have ended up sp- and so before you know it, it's, it's just this jumbled, beautiful mess that we call face-to-face discipleship. And here's the reason why I did this today. I want you guys to see this. This is what, this is the direction that I would like to see our church go into. That we would start doing more face-to-face discipleship. Because this is beautiful. And this is how God grows each and every one of us into strong believers in Jesus Christ. So at the end of the day, face-to-face discipleship, it changes everything. And I believe it will change the face of our church. So here's my challenge to you. I'm going to challenge you to go to a small group this week. And I want you to start thinking about who has God placed in your life Who goes to this church? Who needs to come with you to small group? Because church and, you know, come to church on Sunday and small group are the environments by which we meet the people that God is going to have us spend some face-to-face time with. Face-to-face discipleship changes everything. I want to remind you there's going to come a day where you're going to stand in front of the throne of God and the only words that you're going to remember during that moment, it's not going to be, you're not going to care about how much money you made, what car to car you drove, where you lived, where you vacationed. You know, the only thing that you're going to remember in that moment is Jesus' words, go make disciples. And you're going to be thinking about this as I hope Jesus walks and looks directly into your eyes and says, well done good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would impress upon us the importance of face-to-face discipleship. Lord, I pray that none of us would be able to walk out of here and to do church the same. Lord, and I, and I know when it comes to this service, I, I, we've got mostly people who are volunteers who are investing, but Lord, We can no longer have a church where people are just consumers. This church depends upon this kind of discipleship that needs to happen every single week. Lord, I I pray that we would be inspired to meet up with people for coffee, to text and inspire each other, to read more scripture and to pray together. Lord, I pray that 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 would happen this week, Lord, that we would decide I am going to take the time to do things that really matter. Help us, Lord, to see the things that actually matter in this life. And Lord, I pray that we would be in the business of helping each other to become better disciples of you. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.